Good afternoon. It's great to be back up here uh, presenting another portion of God's Word in front of you. I'd like to thank Kevin for uh, reading that. And if you would, mark in your uh, Bibles that verse. We'll come back to that later. First of all, I'd like to thank our guests for coming this, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have services a little different starting next week, so to my understanding, if that's right. So we're going to have 10 o'clock for guests and then 6.30 starting next Sunday evening. So this will be the last 3.30 service for Sundays. So we'd like to invite you back at any time that you can come. <clears throat> I was going back and forth throughout this. Uh, when you have one chance, and that was my fault because I should have signed up for more. But uh, when you have one chance to present, you have, I had so many things that I wanted to preach for tonight's or this afternoon's lesson. But I figured that the best thing for me to preach for this afternoon was the promises of God. And so I'd like to thank Brian for leading that uh, second song for us this afternoon. So let's go ahead and with nothing further, let's dive into our lesson. So first off, I want to talk about some facts concerning the promises of God. So if you would, let's open up our Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. First thing we're going to talk about is how God promised faithfulness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. <clears throat> and it says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. He being God, promised faithfulness. And so we should definitely not take that lightly. If God promises something, he's going to follow through. So that's the first thing he has promised that I will talk about. And the next thing is that he's able to fulfill his promises. And we read that in Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 13. So if you would turn there to Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 13. This states, for the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So we know from Abraham <coughs> that obviously if he had these promises come to him, he had to, have fa he had to remain faithful about it. So they were through the righteousness of faith. For it is, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, Faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to be the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, and the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. Could you imagine today a 100-year-old being a, new, a newborn father? 100 years old. That's pretty impressive what God can do for us. So continuing, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words, it was counted to him, were not written for his sake alone, but for ours as well. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So we see the promise that God made to Abraham and his offspring, who was Isaac, his wife being barren at 90 years old, him at 100 years old, yet the promise was made that he would have an offspring. Abraham, who was strong in his faith, believed him, and we see what happens next with his offspring being Isaac. 
But I like that, what verse 24 says. They were not written for his sake alone, but for ours as well. So Abraham remained faithful, why can't we? We should remain faithful and trust him, the strong and powerful, who delivered his son, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. A lot of things that we can see from God and how powerful he is. But just these verses alone show us a couple things that he came through with his promise. So why wouldn't he do that for us, as it points out in verse 24? Another fact about the promises of God is that they are true and sure. It says this in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, which states, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count or slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. He is not slow to fulfill his promise. As we have just seen in the last verse in Romans chapter 4, he delivered, he will deliver with us. And the final fact I want to talk about for this slide is God's promises are precious. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 4, verse 4 states, By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So the last fact that we see is God's promises to us are precious. Now, we looked at the facts about the promises of God. Why don't we look at some things that God didn't promise? First, life without difficulty or trials. So we read in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, states that indeed all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. There will be trials. There will be difficulty. In a perfect world, I wouldn't see any red lights. All right, that tests my patience, and it's probably taken about three years off of my dad's life. (laughs) But in a perfect world, Also, in a perfect world, a higher driver would know how to drive. Just jokes, just jokes. But there's difficulty in trials, and uh, that's something he didn't promise, was that we would go through this life perfectly. But that is also on man, because we see in Genesis about the first sin of man. God tried it with the Garden of Eden. But when they first sinned, he cast them out. And so... In 2 Timothy 3.12, we read that we're going to be persecuted. Living godly lives, we are going to be persecuted. That's going to happen. But as we read just a few minutes ago, we have to remain faithful because God has promised us so much, and if we keep our faith, he will deliver it to us. Also, life without enemies. This one's tough. So as we just read, we read that we're going to have trials and difficulties as Christians. What about the enemies that we'll make along the way? Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 10. It says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Which states not only us, we are not the only ones who had to go through all of this. It says in the last one, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They went through the same exact things as we do today. So does that mean that if we make enemies along the way that we should give up? Well, if you see in verse 12, It says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. Yes, we're going to have difficulties. We're going to have trials on this earth. But if you look at verse 12, if we can overcome those and do exactly as God has commanded of us, well, we can rejoice and be glad because our reward is even greater if we can go to heaven. One other thing he did not promise was to save the disobedient. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21. 23. Very, very powerful text here. 
Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do so many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This states, not everyone who says to me will enter the kingdom of heaven. Very powerful verse. That is not something we want to hear at the end of verse 23. But something we can hear if we have faith and do what we're supposed to be doing is well done, thy good and faithful servant. We don't have to learn this because we have been given a chance. We have. We have one chance, but we have been given a great chance because of God's Son who died for us. We don't have to hear those last words in verse 23, depart from me. If we do exactly what we're supposed to be doing, God has given us that chance to hear well done, to enter into the gates of heaven. So yes, he did not promise to save the disobedient. So let's not be the disobedient. How about promising another day of life on earth? James 4, 13 through 15. This is something else he did not promise was another day, a tomorrow. James chapter 4, verse 13 states, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a midst that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. So it says here, we are amidst, we will vanish one day. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. He does not promise that there will be a tomorrow here on earth. Yes, there is eternity after our bodies are dead. But here on earth, tomorrow is not guaranteed. The last thing is another chance after death. John chapter 5, verse 28 through 29. John 5, 28 through 29. By the way, can everybody see all of my slides? I remember last time my words were a little bit small, and that was a, a little bit of a complaint, so I just wanted to make sure it was everybody can see everything behind me. John 5, verse 28 through 29 states, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. We see that tomorrow isn't guaranteed, and we only have one chance. So let's make that chance right today. If today is our last day and tomorrow never comes, let's take advantage of that chance that we are given. We only have one. And at the beginning of verse 29, those who have done good will have the resurrection of life. That could be us. If tomorrow doesn't come and we're doing good in the sight of the Lord, that day will be us getting that rejoice reward that Jesus talks about. So unconditional promises. Those of you who have seen me before know I love my definitions. Unconditional promises, a commitment made by one person to another without any conditions. So these are the promises that God has made no matter what, which states, earth being destroyed by flood again. This is just a verse or a couple verses of God telling Noah that the earth has been wiped out by water with the great flood, but that won't happen again. Yes, we had a flood last week, but I didn't see any arcs going around, right? We're still here today. There was a flood, but we're all still breathing, so... Even if there was a flood last week, earth will not be destroyed by flood again. Another unconditional promise is that the Lord is to come again. So if you would, let's go to Matthew chapter 25, I'm sorry, verse 13. Matthew 25, verse 13. It says, Watch therefore, for you know 
neither today nor the hour. So we have no idea when that day is coming. We have no idea what hour of that day is coming. We have no idea what minute is coming. So watch, take the opportunity that we have been given by God to do what we are supposed to be doing. Could be the next hour, could be tomorrow, could be the next day. It's not guaranteed. We do not know. But what we do know is we have been given that chance. So it is promised, and it also states that in verse 31, which states, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. The Son, being Jesus, will come again. So those are two promises that are unconditional. No matter what, those things are promises of God that are going to happen no matter what. Another promise that is unconditional is all to be raised and judged. We see that in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, which I just read. And then if you keep reading, it talks about when he does sit on his throne and how we're all going to be judged on that very last day. Final one is the resurrection of all. We read that a few minutes ago in John chapter 5, verse 28 through 29. The good going with life and the evil going down to judgment. All of those are unconditional. Those, these things are going to happen. No matter what we do, the Lord will come again. Earth will not be destroyed by flood again. All are going to be raised and judged, and then there will be resurrection for all. So what about the conditional promises? What does he promise us if we do what we're supposed to be doing? Because these are promises or agreements that will only be kept if some condition or event first happens. So these are promises that he makes if we do our part first. Crown of life to the faithful. If you would, let's turn to Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. It states, Do not fear what you are about to suffer, Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful unto death, and we will receive the crown of life. That's something we have to do in order to receive that promise. Something else is the forgiveness of sins, which Kevin read just a few minutes ago. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through 9 states, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when it talks about forgiving us of sins, that means that we have something to be forgiven of, which means if we say we have not sinned, we are wrong. We are all imperfect people, and from time to time there will be sin. That's just a fact of life, but... The loving nature of our Lord and our God to forgive us of our sins. My, my worst challenge as a Christian is forgiving others who have done wrong to me. And I was talking to Roseanne about that yesterday. Something that I struggle with and I need to get better at is forgiving others. But if God forgives me, a sinner in this life, why can't I forgive others? He, the one who is perfect... Me, a sinful creature, yet he is willing to forgive me. So I like to look at this, and there's another, uh, there's another verse in Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 31 and 32, talks about God forgiving us if we go before him and repent of our sins. God knows the right heart that we have. The all-powerful, the almighty, God knows. And if we can go before him, state that we are sorry, and know that we are sorry in our hearts, 
It says right here in 1 John 1, 7 through 9, that he will forgive us of our sins. But that's conditional. Which means he will forgive us if we bring it unto him. That's something we have to do first. What about the peace with God? In Romans 5, 1, talks about having peace within God. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's another conditional promise, the peace that we have with God. Since we have been justified by faith, justified by faith because of his son, we can have that peace with him. Also, salvation if we faithfully endure. So when I look at the conditional part of this promise, if is the big word right there. If we faithfully endure, we have salvation. Some more is rest for the weary. We have that in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Needs are met if we seek God's first, or God first. The big if again, right? If we seek God's fir- God first, the needs are met. Are needs just magically met? This is one of his promises we're given if we do our part first. Happiness if we suffer for Christ. So if you would, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 16. <clears throat> Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we read that earlier in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. And then we have 13 through 16 talking about how we are the salt of the earth. We don't do our part. The earth has lost its taste. That's who we are to be, the salt and lights of the earth. If we suffer for Christ, we have happiness. He has granted that to us. He has promised us this if we suffer for him. Examples of God fulfilling his promises. So when God makes promises, how do we know we can trust him? Well, we know he keeps his word. The promises to Abraham, the land which he has promised to Canaan, makes that promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, 7. What about the nation Israel entering the land? Right, the Israelites. We know about God making those promises in Exodus 14, delivering up from Pharaoh. We have the plagues. We have the exit out of Egypt. And so Joshua in chapters 1 through 5, you can see where Joshua, after Moses has led them, takes his place. And in those first five chapters, we see them entering Canaan, the land that God has promised them. Do they have their trials? Do they have their difficulty? They sure did. But God made that promise, and what happened? No matter how unfaithful they were, no matter what happened along the way, they made it. They made it into that land that he promised. What about Isaiah 53? It talks about Christ. Isaiah 53, and it's in the whole chapter. Whole chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. Talks about... So starting in verse 1, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as you keep reading, it keeps going on, but it talks about Jesus how he grew up. He didn't try to get the attention off the bat. He lived on earth just like we would. He was born. He grew up. He wasn't always like the way he was when he died. He was persecuted as well. He had his trials. He had his tribulations. He had his difficulty on earth. He had all that. Our Savior did. Decided to come down from heaven to do this for us. That is the promise that God gave us was him, Christ. What about the promises to David? 
We see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 9, God telling David, I will make your name great. In verse 10, I will establish a home for Israel. Allow David's son to build God's temple, verses 12 through 13. Makes that promise. Makes the promise. And then what happens in 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 1 through 2? David's son builds the temple. He promises David, your son will build my temple. 1 Kings chapter 6, verses 1, he starts building. He promised, he came through. Which means we can trust God when he promises us things. Why? Because here are two examples of him making promises coming through with them. What about Jesus being delivered? The promise of his son. In Mark chapter 15, verses 21 through 39, that is the full death of Jesus, the full crucifixion. We get the whole scene of Jesus dying in there. And verse 39 talks about his last breath. Do you think Jesus had to do that? Do you think Jesus had to do what he did, or do you think he wanted to because it was out of love and he knew that that was his job to do while he was on earth? God fulfilled his promise. He gave his son. Because of his son, what do we have? We have that chance. Yes, tomorrow is not guaranteed, but because of his son, today we can make that chance right with God. We always have an opportunity because God gave us that. And because of his son coming down to this earth and dying for us, we get that chance. He gave us that. He promised that, and he followed through. So why don't we start ending this a little bit on a positive note. What about victorious life? What about the power of God? Let's turn to 2 Peter, if you would. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We see a little bit about his power here, but what about Genesis 1-1? There's another example of his power. God creates the heavens and the earth. You think any of us can do any of that? He created all of this. He gave us everything we need in life to be successful, to be great Christians unto him. He provided all of this. That's how powerful our God is. He created all this, and his power, because of his love and his power, he can deliver us up from that. He made those promises. We do what we're supposed to be doing, and we can have those promises. He gave us that opportunity. Not merited by grace. So Ephesians 2, 5 through 8 talks about, and I'll turn there right now, Ephesians 2, verses 5 through 8. It says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us together alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. It's not our doing, it's his grace and the gift that he has given to us. How about Second Peter 1.11, the abundant entrance to heaven? Second Peter chapter 1, verse 11 states, For in this way there will richly 
there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do what we're supposed to be doing. This is what we're promised. The entrance to heaven. So if that's not enough, why don't we look at how great heaven is? The place that we have that chance to go to because of God, because of His Son, and because of the promises He made to us. So if you would, turn with me to John. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. John 14, verses 1 through 6. Here's Jesus talking, stating, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. He's basically comparing it to a mansion. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. So Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So not only are they offering up promises, they're teaching us how to get there. Right? Thomas has questions. How do we know the way? I don't know the way. Show us the way. And of course, Jesus providing directions. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody goes to the Father except through me. Through me. You go through me, you see the Father, right? He provides us that path. Not only does he promise that we're going to get there, he promises to show us the way. And that's exactly what Jesus does. A place prepared for you. How do we get there? Through me. Through me, the Son, you will get through the Father, or to the Father. So what about no more tears, pain, or death? Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned by, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. But the former things have passed away. No more. No more pain, no more tears, no more sadness, no mourning, no death of loved ones, no pain, no falling and hurting my ankle, right? It's all gone, wiped away. That place that he has prepared for us, heaven, the place he has promised us, that's what we can experience. No more tears, no pain, no sadness, no more mountaineers losing, none of that. Nothing bad, just us worshiping our God. That's the place that he has for us. That's the place that he gave us a chance to go to. That's the place Jesus gave us directions to get to, through him. How do we do that? We live that life that we're supposed to live. God granted us that. He promises us this. Let's go through him. Let's go through Jesus. Let's get to God. A rest for a weary labor. Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 11. Finally, it talks about its radiance like a most rare jewel. So not only does it talk about the rooms, not only does it talk about how much we get to enjoy it, it also states how beautiful it is, how beautiful heaven is. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 10 through 11, And he carried me away in the spirit 
to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. This is that place. It provides us a little bit of a picture here, right? We see it. How beautiful that place is. A rest for us. We get to rest. No more tears, pain, or death. A place prepared for us. Are we going to have trials here? Are we going to have difficulty? Yes, we will. But look at this reward Jesus talks about. Look at the place that we can go to. This is it right here. Is it going to be worth it? Yes, it will be worth it. When I'm at Borman, I teach about my job description is more of if a student can't come to school or if a student has behavior issues, I have to be there for them and support them and give them, you know, stuff that they need in order su to succeed in those areas. And they always tell me, everything always gets better when you offer up a reward, right? When it comes to kids and, you know, I'll say, if, if you come to school this many days this week, I'll get you a little truck, right? They'll do it every time. I'll be there, Mr. Heasley. I'll be there every day. I'll come as soon as I can, right? I'll make sure I'm good in this class. I'll get to say in here. It's just, for some reason, that makes me make the comparison here, right? We have that reward. We have a chance. But not only is that reward, it's not just going to last us a week. This is eternal. This is forever. Once we get into this place, once we do what we're supposed to be doing, once we take advantage of that chance that we have been given, that's the place we're going to be at forever, not just a week. We're not being at the beach for a few days, right? We're going to this very special place for eternity. This is the reward that we are offered up. Are we going to make enemies? Yes. And I hate that because I want everybody to get into heaven, just like you all do. But there will be enemies along the way. We live in an imperfect world. But in heaven, there's no enemies. There's no mocking. All there is is worship with the ones we love, with the angels of heaven, with our God, with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who died for us. That's all we get to see for eternity. That's for us. We do what we're supposed to be doing. We get that. So finally, for this afternoon, <clears throat> maybe, maybe in your life you're thinking maybe in the past week or so, or maybe you've been a little bit away at Christ. You've been doing stuff that maybe he has not approved of, that God has approved of, and think, I want to reach that place. I haven't been living my life the way I'm supposed to. I want to make it right. You have this chance right now. We're about to go in that next part of our worship. That offers you that. When this invitation song hits and we start singing, that is your chance. You have not been living right with God. Come forward. Or if you need baptized, washed away our sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You have that opportunity as well if you would come as we stand and as we sing this invitation song.